if you can stand with me, we'll go ahead and read some scripture one time. Acts 2 and verse number 41. I think I'm supposed to have this microphone on. This right here is the power of God, so you have to have it. God doesn't use you unless you have this on you. I'm being sarcastic, of course. All right. Do we have it there, brother? Yeah. Okay. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were, get, were together and had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they... Continually, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for your words, and we <coughs> humbly acknowledge that we do not have the wisdom to understand what you've written. And so we ask that you would impart to us understanding, that your spirit would reveal to us the truths of your Bible. Thank you, Lord, for the work that you've done in all of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the salvation you brought to me. And thank you for the testimony of these ones that have, that have uh, tonight have, uh, have talked about you, glorified your name. May, Lord, you help us to be all that you desire us to be. And may, Lord, you accomplish your will in our service tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I read Acts chapter number 2. This is an important passage to me as a preacher because uh, I want to, uh, all the years I've been involved in ministry, I've had a real heart and passion for church planting. And I've been involved in some uh, church planting projects. And so when you think church planting, you think, let's go back to the original blueprint. Let's go back to the foundation. Let's go back to, uh, you know, the basic nuts and bolts of what a church should be, which leads me to Acts <coughs> chapter number 2. And truly, what we're looking at here is a first century church. And can I say to you that the problem with churches today, and that's a general statement and perhaps sounds derogatory, but the problem that we're facing with churches today is that we're a picture of 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 the first century church. And somewhere in all of that, we've copied and 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 copied the church. And somewhere in all that, we've lost what the first church was, which is what God would have the church to be. And so uh, with that in mind, I, I, I've, I found with passion this passage to understand it. And what, what was the first church like? And, and I'll admit that when I've read over it, I, I was naive. I looked at Acts chapter number 2 as we would look at Genesis chapter number 2. Because in Genesis chapter 2, we see Adam and Eve was made, and everything was perfect. There was no arguments. Can you imagine that? No arguments, no contention. And, and uh, the husband said something, and she said, yes, ma'am, and, and uh, yes, sir, I mean, and, you know, and he, he said she would be able to, no problems. Everything was perfect inside the home. But we know that Acts, uh, Genesis chapter 2 was before the fall of man, and it was before there was any sin in earth, and so it was before that, you know, that evil uh, sin, S-I-N, I, right in the middle. I, the problem of I entered into the picture. And that is my whole problem. That's the whole problem with mankind. Pride, the sinner's I, sin, the sinner's I. is I. It's me, 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 me. And so Acts chapter number 2 is after the fall of man. And so as we look at this, we can think, easily say, hey, you know, this church here, well, everything was perfect. They didn't have problems. You know, they didn't argue. They didn't fight. There was no contention. There was no problems at all. It was a great church. And too many times I've heard people say, I'm not going to that church because of how the people act, because of who the people are. And I cannot change you or myself in that regards. Uh, we are sinners, and there's going to be, along the way, mistakes that we make, comments that we shouldn't have said. You know. And uh, if you're looking to leave, you might as well just go ahead and leave now. I mean, if you're going to leave church, just go ahead and leave now. Don't don't put us through all the misery of the, you know, 
and the drama of it, if you're looking for it. There's no perfect home and no perfect church. Nothing's perfect. But we should strive to be what a church should be. And so as I read over this passage, I thought, gracious, this, this church here uh, wasn't perfect. And yet the Bible doesn't really let us understand the imperfections of the church. But what I do know is that this church, though it wasn't perfect, it was going in the right direction. And that's why the Lord gives us this clear picture in Acts chapter 2 and the following chapters. But can I say, have you ever thought about the things that were missing in the first church? For instance, they didn't have a constitution. Now, I can tell you, when the first church I started, we uh, adapted. I, I was uh, sent out of Crossroads, and then I utilized their constitution. Then we had to bring in our own constitution. I went around all the memberships. I had people that attended the church for a year, people who had led to Christ. I made meetings, had meetings set up. My wife and I would go sit down. We had prior given the Constitution. I'd come and sit down. We'd go over the Constitution. I lost people from the church over the Constitution. Oh, we just we just don't agree with this. I agree with what? We just don't agree with the fact that I don't even remember what it was over. Disturbing. It was bothersome to me. At some point, I thought, what's the sense of having a Constitution? We were doing fine before. We fellowship. We took communion. We went soul winning. We, you know, we counseled. We laughed and. But I, I introduce a paper, you know, that's going to be used to govern us as a congregation, and they get upset and they leave the church. You know, did you ever thought about this? They, uh, they didn't have buildings. Now, buildings have become, in our culture, have become the definition of what a church is. I'm struggling right now, and I, I would uh, covet your prayers. Our, uh, one of the churches we started in Nicaragua, the first church we started, they're having a lot of trouble over there. There's, of course, a lot of civil unrest, and uh, a lot of that's not coming through to uh, the media here, but the people being killed, and just a lot of protesting, a lot of fighting, and the government, uh, the military, put in a base directly across the street from our church, it's probably just from here to that TV, and so there's regular fighting right in the front door of the church, the church is on the street, it's just a little sidewalk, three foot sidewalk, and then it's right on the street. And so because of that, people were discouraged about coming to church. And uh, the pastor lived in the church, and he and his family are not safe there, so they're having to find places to stay at nighttime because of the danger. And this, of course, is, you know, has been called, created a lot of unrest. Matagop was expensive. We, we've, we've rented as much as $1,000 a month for a church building in a society where people make $100 a month. And so... Anyway, we have a problem there. And he called me. We talked this week. He said, I don't know what to do, preacher. He said, I, I need a church. I need a place to gather people together and so we can you know, have services. And I say, Jay, the first church didn't have a building. And I'm not saying that buildings are unbiblical or unnecessary. I'm just saying, think about all the problems we have because of buildings. Yeah. Yeah. You know, too much, we finance too much. We don't like how it was built. We don't like the colors. We don't like, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't have a building. You ever thought about this? They didn't have a doctrinal statement. That's pretty important, isn't it? And not only they didn't have a doctrinal statement, but uh, they, they didn't really understand what their doctrine was. And they, they clearly were, were confused about the issue of law and grace. Clearly. They, they couldn't even explain to you what happened in Acts chapter number 2 with the... With the um, this event for the speaking of tongues. They couldn't explain that to you. They didn't know what the Trinity was. That's pretty important to understand the Trinity. Can I get amen on that? Amen. It was probably 150 years before our forefathers, the patriarchs of the church, were able to define what the Trinity, how to explain the Trinity. They were, they just couldn't, they didn't understand how God could be one but three individual people. They understand that. And so they didn't, have, they didn't understand doctrine. They didn't have a doctrinal statement per se. And though they did believe in God and did believe in scriptures, they didn't have a doctrinal statement. Did you ever think about um, the fact that they gathered every day? And, and I think that's good. Pastor talked about this morning, the idea of, you know, so much the more as we see the day approaching. It was I really enjoyed the message this morning. It was a convicting message. 
And yet this early church, they, they met every day, every day, every day. And as the church became organized, we find that the church then went to, you know, we're meeting weekly and multiple times a week, but not necessarily every day. And what I'm saying to you is that they met every day, which is not a show of their organization. It was a show that they didn't have organization. Um, this early church was totally dependent upon the apostles. They didn't have elders. They didn't have bishops or deacons. They didn't have uh, pastors in the church. They were not understanding of spiritual gifts, as talked about in Romans chapter number 13. Uh, they didn't have any clarity about how that lay leadership would work. Uh, we read uh, about the about the early church here in Acts chapter number 2. They, they, in turn, sold all the things they had that were extra over and above and brought it, and they laid it at the feet of the apostles, <coughs> which I think is wonderful. And obviously, they didn't always do that. Again, this, in turn, was... Uh, was not a sign of their organization, but was a sign of the fact they hadn't been organized. Later we find that Paul introduces to them how to show their spirit of giving and explains to them and teaches them proper giving inside the church. Uh, we see that evangelism was primarily done by the apostles. We don't see in the, in the early church that there was lay people necessarily involved in evangelism. It was primarily the apostles that were taking care of that. There was no formal missions program. Imagine that. This church in Jerusalem perhaps was about 50,000 people. Some of the extra biblical books written like the works of Josephus said they think there was as many as 50,000 people in the church. But they had sent no one outside of Jerusalem, even though they were the ones that received the Great Commission to go into all the world preaching gospel. No formal missions program. Now, we today would look at a church and say, you don't have a missions program? Something's wrong with that church. You don't have a doctrinal statement? That church is not biblical. You don't have a constitution? Chaos. That's what that is. It's chaos. It's not a scriptural church. You don't have pastors, deacons, elders inside the church? It's a problem. That church isn't scriptural. You don't have a building? And we, in turn, will judge a church by all the things, listen, that they didn't have. Yet this is the pattern, the picture, the example of what we should be as a church. This church uh, didn't have uh, any church discipline. I was joking this morning. Uh, my daughter and I were going home. That church there, I don't know what road it is, on the way to the pastor's house in the graveyard. I said, you see that graveyard? I said, that's the church discipline program of the church. <laughs> Disobey, they execute you, stick you in the ground right beside the church. <laughs> Pretty good plan. And so, but the early church had no church. And church discipline was, it is a responsibility of the church as a whole. You have disobedient members who perhaps are blaspheming God's words, then it's, it behooves the leadership of the church to lead the congregation to deal with this person who in turn is making making a mockery of Christ and salvation. That's scriptural. And yet the early church didn't have it. Acts chapter 5, we find that God dealt with Ananias and Sapphira, but that was God. That wasn't the church. There was no there was no discipline program that was in the church. The Jews and the Gentiles, what was that ever an issue? I mean, they stumbled and stumbled and stumbled. What? Gentiles can't be saved unless they become a Jew. You know, they, they, they can't be saved. They proselyted. And they struggled and struggled and struggled. So much so, it was difficult for them even to fellowship together. And yet, we look at it now, and as Gentiles, thank God for salvation that was given to us as Gentiles. Amen. Thank God for that. And they didn't understand these things. And so, this church was not perfect. I'm making the point. The point made is that they, they lacked many things, and they were not a perfect church. And if you ever stop to think that, that this church, on one service, perhaps is 120 people in the upper room that met, faithful people that were committed together, that represented this early church. But in one service, Acts chapter number 2, over 3,000 3, Mark Sprouse and Willis's walked in the back door of the church and they got saved. John Cosgrove. Now, I wasn't there when these men got saved, but uh, I'm sure that John Cosgrove has come a little way since the time that he got saved. He came in the back door, and he got saved, and he brought with him all of his baggage. Can I get amen on that? Amen. Yeah. And so can you imagine 3,000 John Cosgroves that were added to the church today? 
I think I'd leave the church. I think I'd leave the church. One is too many for one church. I think I'd leave the church. And so this church brought in all of these, all these unsaved, all these people that got saved, and they were adults. They were people that had lived a life of sin prior. They would walked away according to the course of this world, as Ephesians teaches us. They come in the back door. They're under conviction to get saved. And they were like our sister here that lived one life, and God convicted them and delivered them from it. But there was, they were babies. They didn't understand doctrine and what was right and what was wrong and how to behave and authority and those things and so <coughs> forth. Can you imagine what the environment was like inside the church in those early days, trying to deal with so many new babies in Christ inside the church? No, it wasn't a perfect church, but it is a pattern of what we should be in the church. And we see the activities of the church listed here in Acts chapter number 2. It tells us they gave themselves to the apostles' teaching. There was no New Testament written at this point. The New Testament is written in the following days. Everything we hold today, the last book was written, I believe, in A.D. 90 by John, the apostle John, the book of Revelations. And so in those next years, those next decades, the scripture was written, letters were written, passed around the churches and so forth. And they, as, they got, as the word was given to the apostles, as they came to understand doctrines, then they would teach. Teach us more, Paul, or Peter. Teach us more, John. Teach us more. We want to hear. And they would gather every day, and they would allow themselves informally to be taught things about the scriptures, things of understanding these prophecies that had now no longer were a mystery that had come to life. They also, the Bible says, they, they fellowship. And the fellowship is just that. It's two fellows in the same ship. Their common interest was Christ, not guns or cars or, or being citizens of the United States. Their, their common interest was Christ. They were saved. And they were two fellows in the same ship, two people, three people, five people, but all were in Christ now, and that became the basis of their fellowship, and they just enjoyed being around each other. It wasn't about age and gender. And, and I, I, I enjoy being around people that are my age, but... I enjoy being around people that are not my age, that are twice my age. I enjoy being around people who know Christ and testify about Christ. Some of the sweetest fellowship I've had is not being with people my age, but I've been with people that are 70, 80 years old who tell me about Christ and living in Christ. And so don't, don't confuse yourself about fellowship. So it's good to have people that are common to your age and you struggle together in your faith. But it's good to have people your age if you're struggling together in your faith. Because true fellowship is about being in Christ. Two fellows in the same ship. Two, three, four, five people that are in Christ and are on a journey together. And this early church was not made up of people that they glorified the fact they were Jews. These were people that glorified the fact that they were saved. And that's what brought them together. And they loved to talk about it. You know, don't, don't, it shouldn't become uncomfortable for you to talk about your relationship with God. And and I'm I'm guilty as anybody that uh, I'll make relationships and I'll talk about tangible items about a basketball team or a car or something like that. But I'll never talk to that person about my relationship with Jesus Christ. Make a point to base your fellowship upon your relationship with Jesus. We see also that another activity was breaking of bread. I don't think that was communion. I think it was literally they just ate. Can I get amen on eating? You like eating? I hear about the little girl that went to school, came home. The mother said, uh, she told the mother, we're having show and tell at school tomorrow. And she said, we have to do something about our religion and do a show and tell for it. So the little girl thought for a little while. She thought, okay, I know what I'll do. She went back to school the next day. The teacher said, show and tell time. And Johnny wants you to go first. And Johnny stood up and he said, well, he said, I'm a, I'm a, uh, you know, I'm a Jew. I guess Johnny's not Jew, but anyways, I'm a Jew. And he said, this is a star day. But, oh, that's very good, Johnny. And he said, and the next little boy walked up and he said, I'm a, you know, I'm a Buddhist. And this is the statue of Buddha. Oh, that's really good. That's good. You know, he sat down. And then the little girl stood up and she said, well, I'm a Baptist and this is a casserole. Amen. Good <laughs> <laughs> Baptists are known for eating. Breaking of the bread. And it, for them, it was necessary because they were together every day. And it was informal, unorganized, and they needed to eat. And so they ate together. And by the way, eating is a great joy. Eat together as a family. Eat together as a church. And it's not magical. That was a gift that God gave us. Eating together is a blessing. 
And last week, they gave themselves to prayers. And uh, here they are, teach us something, Peter. And they, they were learning something, and they fellowshipping about Christ. And they, they, someone came by and dropped off some tortilla chips and salsa. And uh, then they said, well, let's just pray about that. And they stopped and prayed. And that was their four activities, all right, in the early church. And that's all we know. And that church is lifted off the pages of the Bible to be the pattern, the picture of what we should be as a church. Now, let's turn, if you will, in the Bible. Let's look, if you will, Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. Um, I've been guilty as the next preacher of identifying these activities in the early church and uh, saying that, uh, that, you know, preaching, that these activities should be a part of a church almost as though it's a to-do list. You know, checking off. Check off, check off. You know, we got the prayers, we got the breaking of bread, the fellowship, etc. Checking it off. And yet, what you're going to find in scriptures is that is that far more emphasis is being placed upon not what you do, but upon the attitudes and the relationships of those people that are in the church. Far more emphasis is placed not upon what you do, but upon the attitude and the relationships that are inside the church. Meaning this, that this New Testament church is not just doing the right thing, but this New Testament church, they have the, the right attitude, they have the right heart, they have the right relationship. They're not only doing the right thing, but they know why they're doing the right thing. There's a joy about it. It's not mechanical with them. This is a lifestyle with these ones. You see, uh, in, uh, if you read in... Uh, you're, in, you're in Ephesians chapter number 4. If you read over in Matthew chapter number 6, and I'm not asking you to turn there, Jesus is preaching, 5, 6, 7, 8, he's preaching a sermon on the mount. And in that passage, what's amazing to me is that Christ, he condemns charity. He condemns good works. He, he condemns in his passage uh, the idea of making of prayers, etc., etc., but he condemns them not because they are wrong, but because they're done in a wrong context or with a wrong attitude. That's kind of interesting. That it's just not a matter of checking off the list. Uh, we prayed. We went soul winning. Uh, we attended church. We did these things. Okay, good. We're a great church, and I'm a good Christian. But, but what God holds us accountable for goes far deeper than that. In the classic passages in Matthew chapter 7, when you had those ones who said, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out demons in thy name? Have we not you know, prophesied in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? And the Lord said, Depart from me, for I never knew you. Now, this is an extreme case. These are people that got confused about what salvation is. But you and I likewise can get confused of what Christian living is or sanctification is. They identify with the works, but they didn't have a right attitude. They didn't have a right relationship. And so these new believers, what we see about them is they were just like newlyweds. I mean, they were living in love. They, they in turn, were loving God and loving man and loved to be together and didn't want to be apart. And, and then few things mattered to them more than just being together and enjoying each other, what they had in Jesus Christ. They were just <clears throat> like newlyweds. And while they were together, these activities were a part of it. They were taught, they fellowshiped, they broke bread, they had prayers. They were involved in these things, but that wasn't what this church was about. They, they just loved being together. They enjoyed it because they had a love relationship with the Lord. This competitive me first attitude that we see in the disciples was gone. I'm the best. No, I'm the best. Can I sit on the right and the left hand, you know, as James and John said? Because I'm the best. I'm the best disciple. I'm the best this. I'm the best that. It was gone. It was no longer in the church. We see that these believers were so generous that they were willing to sell the things that they possessed and cash it in and bring it and lay it at the apostles' feet to be used for the work of God. They were, they just were like newlyweds. Whatever it takes to keep this alive, that's what we want. And so this church had a had a genuine, a genuine love for one another. We look at the book of Ephesians from chapter number 4, and I just want to pull out a few verses here. Ephesians, an interesting book. First three chapters deal with doctrine, things we should do, believe, 
But the last three chapters, four, five, and six, it changes the tone a little bit because it deals with your attitude and your relationship. Verses one says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all loathiness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, etc. It's important, but it's just, I don't want to continue to read the passage because of time. And so here, this is the church of Ephesus. And Paul is writing to these believers and said, look, you need, you need, in verse number three, endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. He's talking about the congregation. He said here that you need to practice lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love. This is in the congregation. In the congregation, you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. He said you need to focus on the oneness that you have in Jesus Christ, one body, one faith, etc." Instead of there being, you know, one emphasizing something different, that we focus on the oneness. Now, this is the church. And so Paul had taken time to talk about the, the doctrine in the first three chapters, but now he changes gears and he's now emphasizing the right attitude and he's emphasizing the right relationships. Now, turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. passage has, uh, has been disturbing to me. And uh, Revelations 2, we have the seven letters written to the churches. These seven letters are seven literal churches. Now, uh, we would believe they represent ages, uh, certainly a pattern of what takes place, temptations that can take place in the church, but they represent seven literal churches that existed during the writing of the book of Revelations when John was writing this. And so he says here in verse number two, verse number one in chapter two, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith, uh, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. What's well, a sobering thought? God knows about this church. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they have, they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left that first love. This church is being accused of having left its first love. Now, there's no, there's no great definition needed for that to leave your first love is to mean that you that you have left uh, the place where you loved as you did in the beginning it was different it wasn't a first love it's now a love that's tarnished and tainted unimportant perhaps and so this church here was a church that had good deeds they had great works, they had right doctrine, they, they were defenders of the faith, and that's what you see. Now there's seven letters written. Of the seven, seven letters that are written uh, of the churches, uh, this church was the cleanest of all of them. This church had the best standards. This church had the best doctrine. And this church was the best at defending the gospel. Did you see that? There was other churches that were very worldly. Worldliness had just got it in the church and they're uh, in sin it's, uh, because of it. There was other churches that had bad doctrine. A and bad doctrine, of course, gives foothold to Satan. Bad doctrine is the fraud your faith. And so there was other churches that in turn, they were not what they were supposed to be. But this church was the streakiest. This, the one that was the most streaky clean of all of them. They had right standards, right works, right doctrine. And I would say that it's a church that, that we would want to be. We, we want to have right doctrine. Can I get amen on that? We, we want to make sure that we're a church that has right works, that we are working out our faith. We want to be a church that has right standards in age and time and where the climate is that, that there is no standard of holiness that we should be a church that in turn holds up a standard of holiness unto our God because he's worthy of that. 
And so this church had those things. They had right works, right doctrine. They had, they had right standards. But yet we find that the Lord said, I have somewhat against you. I have a problem with you because you've left your first love. You in turn are, you've left where you were in the beginning. Your love relationship with me and with man isn't the same as it was before. And he said, I have a problem with you. Yes, you have right works and right doctrine. Yes, in turn, you have right standards, but you have lost your love life. And he said, so much so, look at verse number five. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Did you see what the Lord said? The Lord said this. A candlestick represented their position and power as a church. The candlestick literally represented their, validated them as a church in God's eyes. You understand there's a lot of buildings and a lot of congregations that congregate together, but they're not a church in God's eyes. They may have a constitution, they may have a doctrinal statement, they may have a pastor, they may have deacons, they may have programs and children's programs, they may have all those things, but they're not in the candlestick. The Lord said, look, church, you may have the right doctrinal statement, and you may have good works, defending the faith, etc., and you may have right standards. He said, but you, you, are, you are right now jeopardizing being removed out of the candlestick. Not because of doctrine, not because of standards, and not because of their, uh, their works. He said, but because you've left your first love. You know what's interesting about that? Out of the seven churches, that's the only one that he threatened to discipline. The church that was the best of all of them. A church that was the most ordered. The church that had right standards. The church that had right doctrine. The church that had right works. Was the one the Lord threatened to discipline. Because they left the first one. Now, what am I trying to say? We look at the church, uh, the church of uh, in Acts chapter number two. You understand this church didn't have any of those things, but that's why the church in Acts chapter number two is our pattern. They were in love. They were in love with God, and they were in love with the brethren. Look in First John chapter number. We're almost finished. Verse number 10, chapter 3 says, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that you should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and he and ye know that no murder hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever hath this world's good, and seeth his brother hath need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Um, our churches are under attack too often by people that are in the congregation and they create division in the church because of doctrine, works, or standards. And don't misunderstand me. Doctrine, work, and standards are real important. I think they're very important. And I think we can have both of them. I was fellowship with a pastor last week, and he said, I had this family in my church, and they were the most faithful people, and they were there. They were workers. Man, they were workers. Went soul winning and worked physically around the church, and they gave and so forth, but they constantly broke the unity in the church, the peace in the church, because of Christmas treats or because of 
a song that was sung and he researched the person who wrote the song and found out that that person had smoked a joint when they were six years old or something. I don't know. <laughs> and this one, he said it was endless. He said it got to be, just said in church service, that I found myself always nervous. How does that person feel about this? What do they think about that? What, what, how are they going to be? And this is a pastor who's trying to do everything right. Can I say to you, that's not a person who fights you know, to have all these standards in their life. It's not necessarily a person that is godly. Well, I do believe in standards. I do believe in it. I believe in doctrine. I believe in works. <laughs> but the most purest example of your godliness is not seeing your work standards and your doctrine, but your most purest example of your godliness is seeing your love. Your love for God. And if you have a love for God, then it naturally will spill out to the love for your brother. And I've been in church work long enough to see that people are, there's some people that come to church and they're, it's just a checklist to them. They just check it off. But the love of God is not coming out through the love of brethren. And understand, that church in Ephesus, if we saw it, we'd say, that's the church I'm going to go to. But it's right. Do you see their doctrinal statement? Do you see their works? Do you see their standards? I'm going to that church. That was a church the Lord threatened to judge because they lost their love relationship with God. You need not to turn here, but listen to this passage. Here. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never falleth, faileth. For whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away child's things. But now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even also as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Scripture defines for us how this love plays out in our life. And John said, hereby perceive we. Perceive means that you're able to see, but not just see understand. Hereby perceive we the love of God that he John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 1 John 3.16 Hereby perceive we the love of God that he laid down his life for us. Now listen to this last verse. Jesus said to the disciples By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Love the brethren. Now, is connections a church? Well, we have a building, don't we? <laughs> we've got a constitution, we have a doctrinal statement, we've got some standards and works and so forth. But how's our love life? That's what Acts chapter number 2, what made it the pattern of what a church should be. The church should be a place that not only love to come, as Pastor talked about today, but a place in turn where we are given to show our love. My love today is a reflection of the love I've received from God. My life was changed by a church, or changed by God, of course. I got saved you know, by Christ and it was changed, but I was a young person, young teenager, 
Um, did not grow up in a, a home that was Christian. And uh, during those years, my family was having uh, problems. And uh, I'd ultimately go stay with my grandmother. And um, my grandmother was a simple lady, third grade education. She could hardly write, but she was a godly lady. And she would take me to church, Liberty Baptist Church, which is where I attend now, which is the church Pastor Johnson attended, attended some years ago. That's how I met him. And so I got saved. And I would go to church, and uh, all those gray-headed ladies would come up and hug me and kiss me, and the young men would shake my hand, and they, they all gave me nicknames, and they would talk to me, and, I, and they would tell me things and ask me things and take me places. They'd call me up and say, Marty, we're going to go over here and listen to this preacher. You want to go with us? And I thought, sure. Marty, we're going to go here after church and go and get something. You want to go with us? And I said, sure. And I, I loved going to church. I loved going to church. It was my favorite thing to do. And I went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Saturday, Thursday night for visitation. I was there, and normally I lived, you know, seven, eight, nine miles away. I'd ride my bicycle to church. I'd call people to church in the, phone, uh, in the church and say, can you please come pick me up? Can you go 25 minutes out of your way and come pick me up and take me to church? I mean, the thought of not going to church in a week it crushed me. And I was at church so much that Pastor Johnson came up to me one day and said, here, here's a key to the church. I was 14. Here's the key to the church. He said, you're always the first one here, last one to leave. Here's the key to the church. Just take care. I still have the key today. 36 years later. I still got the key. I love going to church. And can I say to you, I didn't know anything about Bible. I didn't, I mean, I was struggling to have standards, and I was trying to figure out I didn't know how to win people to Christ. But I was in love with the Lord, and I was around people that loved. They showered me with love. Changed my life. Changed my life. Acts chapter 2. They had a life love relationship. Watch what it says in verse 47. And the Lord added daily to the church. All these people, all these preachers are studying and trying to rack their brains on how to grow a church. God already has a plan. We in turn fall in love with him and fall in love with one another. He'll add to the church. Our weakened relationships with God, which reflects with our weakened relationships with one another, why would anybody want to come and be a part of that anyway? It's true, isn't it? Father, we thank you for your words. We pray that you'd help us to be a to be an Acts chapter number two church. We thank you for what you already have done here just in a short period of time, the people that you that have come together and, and how that it would seem and appears that you just laid out open doors and answered prayers and so forth. But Lord, let this, let this be the beginning, not of a church that is known by its works or doctrine or known by its uh, standards, but a church that is known by its love. And I pray this church will invest in a relationship with you and invest in a relationship with one another. That they, they wouldn't matter that one may be 12 or the other may be 80, but they in turn would love one another and they would show it. And we believe, Lord, that if we in turn will take care of the church, that you in turn will be involved in growing the church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being in church. Make sure you say hi to everybody before you leave, and I'll uh, see you next time.